In the last video, we looked at Catherine's Gothic expectations and how those expectations put her into some uncomfortable situations and create both embarrassment and disappointment. And at the same time, how she is exposing herself to a real world plot, although not necessarily a sinister plot by General Tilney. So now in this video, we're going to look at how that plays out as she increasingly exposes herself to more and more absurd situations brought about by her Gothic expectations, while unaware of becoming the target of General Tilney's plot to marry her to his son, and how her embarrassment at the situations in which she places herself ultimately teaches her to look at the world through a framework that allows her to perceive General Tilney's actual circumstance and resolve her relationship with Henry. Back to page 112, we get Catherine's second exposure to the silliness of her Gothic expectations in a modern house and a lesson that she should learn but doesn't seem to be able to retain. So immediately after the family starts heading off to bed, she goes to a room and rather than being sent to a deserted wing in a spacious chamber distant from everyone else, she goes back to a relatively nice room only two doors down from Miss Tilney's room and recognizes that her gothic expectations were silly. She had nothing to dread from midnight assassins or drunken gallants. Henry had certainly been only in jest when he had told her that morning. In a house so furnished and so guarded, she could have nothing to explore or to suffer and might go to her bedroom as securely as if it had been her own chamber at Fullerton. However, she has not yet fully given up her gothic expectations. After Henry's story that morning as they were arriving, Catherine notices a large black chest in the room. The fire therefore died away, and Catherine, having spent the best part of an hour in her arrangements, was beginning to think of stepping into bed when... On giving a parting glance around the room, she was struck by the appearance of a high, old-fashioned black cabinet, which, though in a situation conspicuous enough, had never caught her notice before. Remember, in Henry's story, she goes to the chambers behind the hidden door, and then after carefully inspecting the room, leaves them, then comes back and carefully inspects the room again and finds a large black chest. And so this, again, resonates with Catherine's expectations. Henry's words, his description of the ebony cabinet which was to escape her observation at first, immediately rushed across her. And though there could be nothing really in it, there, there was something whimsical. It was certainly a very remarkable coincidence. So she goes to look at the cabinet. The key was in the door, and she had a strange fancy to look into it. Not, however, with the smallest expectation of finding anything, but it was so very odd after what Henry had said. In short, she could not sleep till she had examined it. And notice that we are going to now shift back into the parody of the Gothic novel language. So placing the candle with great caution on a chair, she seized the key with a very tremulous hand and tried to turn it, but it resisted her utmost strength. Alarmed but not discouraged, she tried it another way. A bolt flew and she believed herself successful. But how strangely mysterious, the door was still immovable. She paused a moment in breathless wonder. The wind roared down the chimney. The rain beat in torrents against the windows, and everything seemed to speak to the awfulness of her situation. To retire to bed, however unsatisfied on such a point, would be in vain, since sleep must be impossible with a consciousness of a cabinet so mysteriously closed in her immediate vicinity. Again, therefore, she applied herself to the key, and after moving it in every possible way for some instance with the determined celerity of Hope's last effort, the door suddenly yielded to her hand. Her harp leapt with exultation at such a victory, and having thrown open each folding door, the second being secured only by a bolt of less wonderful construction than the lock, though in that her eye could not discern anything unusual, a double range of small drawers appeared in view, with some larger drawers above and below them, and in the center a small door, closed also with a lock and key, secured in all probability a cavity of importance. Catherine's heart beat quick, but her courage did not fail her. With a cheek flushed by hope and an eye straining with curiosity, her fingers grasped the handle of the drawer and drew it forth. It was entirely empty. With less alarm and greater eagerness, she seized a second, a third, and a fourth. Each was equally empty. None was left unsearched, and in not one was anything found. Well read in the art of concealing a treasure, the possibility of false linings to the drawers did not escape her, and she felt round each with anxious acuteness in vain. 
The place in the middle alone remained now unexplored, and though she had never from the first had the smallest idea of finding anything in any part of the cabinet, and was not in the least disappointed at her ill success thus far, it would be foolish not to examine it thoroughly while she was about it. It was some time, however, before she could unfasten the door, the same difficulty occurring in the management of this inner lock as the outer. But at length it did open, and not vain as hitherto was her search. Her eyes directly fell on a roll of paper pushed back into the farther part of the cavity, apparently for concealment. And her feelings at that moment were indescribable. Her heart fluttered, her knees trembled, and her cheeks grew pale. She seized with an unsteady hand the precious manuscript, for half a glance sufficed to ascertain written characters. And while she acknowledged with awful sensations the striking exemplification of what Henry had foretold, resolved instantly to pursue every line before she attempted to rest. The dimness of the light her candle emitted made her turn to it with some alarm, but there was no danger of its sudden extinction. It yet had some hours to burn, and that she might not have any greater difficulty in distinguishing the writing than what its ancient date might occasion, she hastily snuffed it. Snuffed it means pushed the wax down and exposed more of the wick, not putting it out. Alas, it was snuffed and extinguished in one. A lamp could not have expired with more awful effect. Catherine, for a few moments, was motionless with horror. It was done completely. Not a remnant of light in the wick could give hope to with a rekindling breath. Darkness, impenetrable and immovable, filled the room. A violent gust of wind, rising with sudden fury, added fresh horror to the moment. Catherine trembled from head to foot. In the pause which succeeded, a sound like receding footsteps and the closing of a distant door struck her affrighted ear. Human nature could support no more. A cold sweat stood on her forehead. The manuscript fell from her hand. And groping her way to the bed, she hastily jumped in and sought some suspension of agony by creeping far underneath the clothes. To close her eyes and sleep that night, she felt must be entirely out of the question. With a curiosity so justly awakened, her feelings in every way so agitated, repose must be absolutely impossible. The storm too abroad so dreadful. She had not been used to feel alarm from wind, but now every blast seemed fraught with awful intelligence. The manuscript so wonderfully found, so wonderfully accomplishing the morning's predictions. How was it to be accounted for? What could it contain? To whom could it relate? By what means could it have been so long concealed? And how singularly strange that it should fall to her lot to discover it. Till she had made herself mistress of its contents, however, she could have neither repose nor comfort. And with the sun's first ray she was determined to peruse it. But many were the tedious hours which must yet intervene. She shuddered tossed about in her bed and envied every quiet sleeper. Again, a trope from the Gothic novel. The storm still raged, and various were the noises, more terrific even than the wind, which struck at intervals her startled ear. The very curtains of her bed seemed at one moment in motion, at another the lock of her door is agitated, as if by the attempt of somebody to enter. All her murmurs seemed to creep along the gallery, and more than once her blood was chilled by the sound of distant moans. Hour after hour passed away, and the wearied Catherine had heard three proclaimed by all the clocks in the house before the tempest subsided, or she unknowingly fell fast asleep. And then, of course, the next morning she gets up, finds the roll, and finds something unexpected. Her greedy eye glanced rapidly over a page. She started at its import. Could it be possible, or did her senses play her false? An inventory of linen and coarse and modern characters seemed all that was before her. If evidence of sight might be trusted, she held a washing bill in her hand, so it's basically a laundry list. Her anticipated discovery of a long-lost manuscript by some prisoner in the room, hidden deep within the cabinet, turns out to just be someone's forgotten laundry list that had not been noticed because it was shoved back in the back of a drawer. She felt humbled to the dust. Could not the adventure of the chest had taught her wisdom? A corner of it catching her eye as she lay seemed to rise up in judgment against her. Nothing could now be clearer than the absurdity of her recent fancies. To suppose that a manuscript of many generations back could have remained undiscovered in a room such as that, so modern, so habitable, or that she should be the first to possess the skill of unlocking a cabinet, the key of which was open to all. So if you're going to lock something up, so that no one finds it, you probably are going to take the key and hide it and not leave it in the cabinet. How could she have imposed on herself? 
Heaven forbid that Henry Tilney should ever know her folly. Worse, she discovers that the cabinet probably wasn't locked at all, and the reason she had such difficulty unlocking the doors to the cabinet and the middle hidden door in the center was that she herself had locked it to begin with. Why the lock should have been so difficult to open, however, was still something remarkable, for she could now manage them with perfect ease. In this there was surely something mysterious, and she indulged in the flattering suggestion for half a minute, till the possibility of the doors having been at first unlocked and of being herself its fastener darted into her head and cost her another blush. She got away as soon as she could from a room in which her conduct produced such unpleasant reflections. This is Catherine's second lesson about the silliness of her gothic expectations, but she still has one more important lesson to learn, which will ultimately be her final lesson. Catherine's final lesson in realistic expectations comes when, despite all of her previous experiences, she decides that General Tilney must be a gothic villain who has entrapped his wife in a cellar somewhere and is feeding her bread scraps and gruel, or he has either willfully murdered her or allowed her to die from inattention. The first indication to Catherine that something is dreadfully wrong is that the general does not wish to give her a tour of inside, but rather takes her on a tour outside of the house. Catherine did not know how this was to be understood. Why was Miss Tilney embarrassed? Could there be any unwillingness on the general's side to show her over the abbey? The proposal was his own. And was it not odd that he should always take his walk so early? Neither her father nor Mr. Allen did so. It was certainly very provoking. Later, during the tour of the outside of the Abbey grounds, they visit what had once been Mrs. Tilney's, Eleanor's mother's favorite walk, and the general prefers not to enter the walk. I am particularly fond of this spot, said her companion with a sigh. It was my mother's favorite walk. Catherine had never heard Mrs. Tilney mentioned in the family before, and the interest excited by this tender remembrance showed itself directly in her altered countenance and in the attentive pause with which she waited for something more. I used to walk here so often with her, added Eleanor, though I never loved it then as I have loved it since. And at that time, indeed, I used to wonder at her choice, but her memory endears it to me now. And ought it not, reflected Catherine, to endear it to her husband? Yet the general would not enter it. Mrs. Tilney considered silent and ventured to say, her death must have been a great affliction. So Catherine is already starting to put together two and two and coming up with five. Farther on down, on page 121, was she a very charming woman? Was she handsome? Was there any picture of her in the abbey? And why had she been so partial to that grove? Was it from a dejection of spirits? Were questions now eagerly poured forth. The first three received a ready affirmative. The other two were passed by, and Catherine's interest in the deceased Mrs. Tilney augmented with every question whether answered or not. Of her unhappiness in marriage, she felt persuaded. The general certainly had been an unkind husband. He did not love her walk. Could he therefore have loved her? And besides, handsome as he was, there was something in the turn of his features which spoke of his not having behaved well to her. Her picture, I suppose, blushing at the consummate art of her own question, hangs in your father's room? No, it was intended for the drawing room, but my father was dissatisfied with the painting, and for some time it had no place. Soon after her death I obtained it for my own and hung it in my bedchamber, where I shall be very happy to show it you it is very like. Here was another proof, a portrait, very like, of a departed wife, not valued by her husband. He must have been dreadfully cruel to her. Catherine attempted no longer to hide from herself the nature of the feelings which, in spite of all his attentions, he had previously excited, and what had been terror and dislike before was now absolute aversion. Yes, aversion. His cruelty to such a charming woman made him odious to her. She had often read of such characters, characters which Mr. Allen had been used to call unnatural and overdrawn, but here was proof positive to the contrary. And so Catherine is once again taking her Gothic framework, applying it to General Tilney's behavior, and drawing conclusions in very circular logic that because she has reached these ridiculous assumptions about General Tilney's behavior, that therefore here is validation of the basis of those ridiculous assumptions. Later, on page 125, Eleanor consents to give Catherine a more detailed tour of the indoors of the abbey and is leading her to the section of the abbey where her mother's, where Eleanor's mother's, bedroom had been. 
The gallery was terminated by folding doors, which Miss Tilney, advancing, had thrown open and passed through, and seemed on the point of doing the same by the first door of the left and another long reach of gallery, when the general, coming forwards, called her hastily, and, as Catherine thought, rather angrily back, demanding whether she was going. And what was there more to be seen? Had not Miss Moreland already seen all that could be worth her notice? And did she not suppose her friend might be glad of some refreshment after so much exercise? Miss Tilney drew back directly, and the heavy doors were closed upon the mortified Catherine, who, having seen in a momentary glance beyond them a narrower passage, more numerous openings, and symptoms of a winding staircase, believed herself at last within the reach of something worth her notice, and felt, as she unwillingly paced back the gallery, she would rather be allowed to examine that end of the house than see all the finery of the rest. The general's evident desire of preventing such an examination was an additional stimulant. Something was certainly to be concealed. Her fancy, though it had trespassed lately once or twice, in her mistaken beliefs about the trunk and about the cabinet, could not mislead her here. And what that something was, a short sentence of Miss Tilney's as they followed the general at some distance downstairs, seemed to point out, I was going to take you into what was my mother's room, the room in which she died, were all her words. But few as they were, they conveyed pages of intelligence to Catherine, it was no wonder that the general should shrink from the sight of such objects as that room must contain, a room in all probability never entered by him since the dreadful scene had passed, which released his suffering wife and left him to the stings of conscience. How long ago may it be that your mother died? She has been dead these nine years, and nine years, Catherine knew, was a trifle of time compared with what generally elapsed after the death of an injured wife before her room was put to rights. You were with her, I suppose, to the last? No, said Miss Tilney, sighing. I was unfortunately from home. Her illness was sudden and short, and before I arrived it was all over. Catherine's blood ran cold with the horrid suggestions which naturally sprang from these words. Could it be possible? Could Henry's father? And yet how many were the examples to justify even the blackest suspicions? And when she saw him in the evening, while she worked with her friends, slowly pacing the drawing room for an hour together in silent thoughtfulness, with downcast eyes and a contracted brow, she felt secure from all possibility of wronging him. It was the air and attitude of a Montoni. What more could plainly speak the gloomy workings of a mind not wholly dead to every sense of humanity in its fearful review of past scenes of guilt? Unhappy man, and the anxiousness of her spirits directed her eyes toward his figure so repeatedly as to catch Miss Tilney's notice. My father, she whispered, often walks about the room in this way. It is nothing unusual. So much the worse, thought Catherine. Such an ill-timed exercise was out of peace with the strange unreasonableness of his morning walks, and boded nothing good. And of course, Catherine's fears and sentiments get even worse. General Tilney is a habit of staying up late at night reading over papers, which Catherine is determined must be evidence of his guilt. But neither the business alleged nor the magnificent compliment could win Catherine from thinking that some very different object must occasion so serious a delay of proper repose. To be kept up for hours after the family were in bed by stupid pamphlets was not very likely. There must be some deeper cause. Something was to be done which could be done only while the household slept. And the probability that Mrs. Tilney yet lived, shut up for causes unknown and receiving from the pitiless hands of her husband a nightly supply of coarse food was the conclusion which necessarily followed. Shocking as was the idea, it was at least better than the death unfairly hastened as, in the natural course of things, she must ere long be released. The suddenness of her reputed illness, the absence of her daughter, and probably of her other children at the time, all favored the supposition of her imprisonment. Its origin, jealousy perhaps, or wanton cruelty, was yet to be unraveled. In revolving these matters while she undressed, it suddenly struck her that as not unlikely that she might that morning have passed very near the spot of this unfortunate woman's confinement might have been within a few paces of the cell in which she languished out her days, for what part of the abbey could be more fitted for the purpose than that which yet bore the traces of monastic division? In the high arched passage, paved with stone, which already she had trodden with peculiar awe, she well remembered the doors of which the general had given no account. To what might not those doors lead? In support of the plausibility of this conjecture, it further occurred to her that the forbidden gallery, in which the apartments of the unfortunate Miss Tilney must be, as certainly as her memory could guide her exactly over the suspected range of cells, 
and the staircase by the side of those apartments of which she had caught a transient glimpse, communicating by some secret means with those cells, might well have favored the barbarous proceedings of her husband. Down that staircase she had perhaps been conveyed in a state of well-prepared insensibility. Catherine sometimes started at the boldest of her own surmises, and sometimes hoped or feared that she had gone too far, but they were supported by such appearances as made their dismissal impossible. Catherine continues to collect further evidence which convinces her of the certainty of the general's guilt of his horrid mistreatment of his wife, until finally she has a moment alone and determines that she will investigate and perhaps free the imprisoned Mrs. Tilney. It was done, and Catherine found herself alone in the gallery before the clocks had ceased to strike. It was no time for thought. She hurried on, slipped with the least possible noise through the folding doors, and without stopping to look or breathe, rushed forward to the one in question. The lock yielded to her hand, and luckily, with no soul and sound that could alarm a human being, on tiptoe she entered. The room was before her, but it was some minutes before she could advance another step. She beheld what fixed her to the spot and agitated every feature. She saw a large, well-proportioned apartment, a handsome dimity bed, arranged as unoccupied with a housemaid's care, a bright bath stove, mahogany wardrobes, and neatly painted chairs on which the warm beams of a western sun gaily poured through the two sash windows. Catherine had expected to have her feelings worked, and worked they were. Astonishment and doubt first seized them, and a shortly succeeding ray of common sense added some bitter emotions of shame. She could not be mistaken as to the room, but how grossly mistaken in everything else. In Miss Tilney's meaning, in her own calculation, this apartment to which she had given a date so ancient, a position so awful, proved to be one end of what the general's father had built. There were two other doors in the chamber, leading probably into dressing closets, but she had no inclination to open either. Would the veil in which Mrs. Tilney had last walked, or the volume in which she had last read, remain to tell what nothing else was allowed to whisper? No, whatever might be the general's crimes, he had certainly too much wit to let them sue for detection. She was sick of exploring and desired but to be safe in her own room, with her own heart privy to its folly. She was on the point of retreating as softly as she had entered, when the sound of footsteps she could hardly tell where made her pause and tremble. The person who comes up is Mr. Tilney, the last person she wants to know of her silliness. Tilney comes up from a back staircase, the spiral staircase that Catherine had been certain led down to the chambers in which Mrs. Tilney was entombed, and asks her what she's doing there, and and after some conversation, Catherine is forced to unwillingly reveal while she was there. Yes, a great deal. That is, Eleanor has talked a great deal about her mother. That is, no, not much. But what she did say was very interesting. Her dying so suddenly, slowly and with hesitation, it was spoken. And you, none of you being at home, and your father, I thought, perhaps had not been very fond of her, and from these circumstances, he replied, his quick eye fixed on hers. You infer, perhaps, the probability of some negligence? Some. Involuntarily, she shook her head. Or it may be of something still less pardonable. She raised her eyebrows toward him more fully than she had ever done before. My mother's illness, he continued, the seizure which ended in her death was sudden. The malady itself, one from which she had often suffered, a bilious fever, its cause therefore constitutional. On the third day, in short, as soon as she could be prevailed on, a physician attended her, a very respectable man, and in one whom she had always placed great confidence. Upon his opinion of her danger, two others were called in the next day, and remained in almost constant attendance for four and twenty hours. On the fifth day, she died. During the progress of her disorder, Frederick and I, we were both at home, saw her repeatedly, and from our own observation can bear witness to her having received every possible attention which could spring from the affection of those about her, or which her situation in life could command. Poor Eleanor was absent, and at such a distance as to return only to see her mother in her coffin. But your father, said Catherine, was he afflicted? For a time greatly so. You have erred in supposing him not attached to her. He loved her, I am persuaded, as well as it was possible for him to. We have not all, you know, the same tenderness of disposition. And I will not pretend to say that while she lived, she might not often have had much to bear. But though his temper injured her, his judgment never did. His value of her was sincere, and if not permanently, he was truly afflicted by her death. I am very glad of it, said Catherine. It would have been very shocking. If I understand you rightly, you had formed a surmise of such horror as I have hardly words to... Dear Miss Moreland, consider the dreadful nations of the suspicions you have entertained. 
What have you been judging from? Remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, that we are Christians. Consult your own understanding, your own sense of the probable, your own observation of what is passing around you. Does our education prepare us for such atrocities? Do our laws connive at them? Could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this, where social and literary intercourse is on such a footing, where every man is surrounded by a neighborhood of voluntary spies, where the roads and newspapers lay everything open? Dearest Miss Moreland, what have you been admitting? They had reached the end of the gallery, and with tears of shame she ran off to her room. The visions of romance were over. Catherine was completely awakened. Finally, Henry's address, short as it had been, had more thoroughly opened her eyes to the extravagance of her late fancies than all their several disappointments had done. Most grievously was she humbled. Most bitterly did she cry. It was not only with herself that she was sunk, but with Henry. Her folly, which now seemed even criminal, was all exposed to him, and he must despise her forever. The liberty which her imagination had dared to take with the character of his father, could he ever forgive it? The absurdity of her curiosity and fears, could they ever be forgotten? She hated herself more than she could express. He had, she thought he had, once or thrice before this fatal morning, shown something like affection for her. But now, in short, she made herself as miserable as possible for about half an hour, went down when the clock struck five, with a broken heart, and could scarcely give an intelligible answer to Eleanor's inquiry if she was well. The formidable Henry soon followed her into the room, and the only difference in his behavior to her was that he paid rather more attention than usual. Catherine had never wanted comfort more, and he looked as if he was aware of it. The evening wore away with no abatement of the soothing politeness, and her spirits were gradually raised to a modest tranquility. She did not learn to forget or defend the past, but she learned to hope that it would never transpire farther, that it might not cost her Henry's entire regard. Her thoughts being chiefly fixed on what she had with such causeless terror felt and done, nothing could shortly be clearer than it had all been a voluntary self-created delusion, each trifling circumstance receiving importance from an imagination resolved in alarm, and everything forced to bend to one purpose by a mind which, before she encountered the abbey, had been craving to be frightened. She remembered with what feeling she had prepared for a knowledge of North Anger. She saw that the infatuation had been created and mischief settled long before her quitting Bath, and that it seemed as if the whole might be traced to the influence to that sort of reading that she had there indulged. Charming as were all Mrs. Radcliffe's works, and charming even as were the works of all her imitators, it was not in them, perhaps, that human nature, at least in the Midland counties of England, was to be looked for. So Catherine is finally, finally, finally figured out that she can't rely on Gothic narratives to supply her framework for reality. Although she hopefully acknowledges that somewhere in Europe the Gothic may really exist, she at least acknowledges it can't be here. There, such as were not as spotless as an angel might have the dispositions of a fiend, but in England it was not so. Among the English, she believed, in their hearts and habits, there was a general though unequal mixture of good and bad. Upon this conviction, she would not be surprised if even in Henry and Eleanor Tilney some slight imperfection might hereafter appear. And upon this conviction, she need not fear to acknowledge some actual specks in the character of their father, who, though cleared from the grossly injurious suspicions in which she must ever blush to have entertained, she did believe, upon serious consideration, to be not perfectly amiable. So now, disabused of her gothic fantasy, Catherine is now finally in a position to recognize the actual situation within which she is involved. First, she recognizes that Isabella is not the friend that Catherine had imagined her, has dumped James, and has taken up with Captain Tilney, who she believes is a better match. But Henry and Eleanor caution her that it is very unlikely that this match will ever go forward, or that General Tilney would consent to it. Because, of course, General Tilney, it turns out, is a fortune hunter. And then Catherine, of course, figures out that since she herself has little fortune, this might damage her desirability to the general as a daughter-in-law. At the beginning of chapter 26, on page 140, from this time the subject was frequently canvassed by the three young people, the subject being the anticipated marriage of Captain Tilney and Isabella. And Catherine found with some surprise that her two young friends were perfectly agreed in considering Isabella's want of consequent and fortune is likely to throw great difficulties in the way of her marrying their brother. Their persuasion that the general would, upon this ground alone, independent of the objection that might be raised against her character, oppose the connection, turned her feelings, moreover, with some alarm towards herself. 
She was as insignificant and perhaps as portionless as Isabella, and if the heir of the Tilney property had not grandeur and wealth enough in himself, at one point of interest were the demands of his younger brother to rest. Eleanor and Henry Tilney believe that Isabella will not be an acceptable mate for Captain Tilney, and it turns out Catherine is not an acceptable mate for Henry once the general comes to believe that she is a pauper as well. The general goes away to London, and Henry and Catherine and Eleanor enjoy relative freedom in the absence of his imposing personality. But while he's gone, unbeknownst to Catherine, the general talks to John Thorpe, and John Thorpe, who is now disappointed in his expectations of marrying Catherine, and also because Isabella and James have broken up, mm -hmm. now claims, in justification of his failed suit for Catherine, now claims that Catherine is actually a pauper and her father a beggar, and the general, believing John Thorpe as he before had believed John Thorpe claiming she was rich when John thought he was to marry her, sends back and has Catherine literally thrown out of the house. And the ignominy of this sudden dismissal is quite clear because of both Eleanor and Catherine's response. Catherine is waiting in her room for Eleanor to come up as usual. At that moment, Catherine thought she heard her step in the gallery and listened for its continuance, but all was silent. Scarcely, however, had she convicted her fancy of error when the noise of something moving close to her door made her start. It seemed as if someone was touching the very doorway, or in another moment a slight motion of the lock proved that some hand must be on it. She trembled a little at the idea of someone's approaching so cautiously, but resolving not to be again overcome by trivial appearance of alarm or misled by a raised imagination, she stepped quietly forward and opened the door. So this time, the hints of some gothic mystery are actually interpreted rightly. Something's going on outside, and Catherine is reasonably going to go find out what it is. Eleanor, and only Eleanor, stood there. Catherine's spirits, however, were tranquilized, but for an instant, for Eleanor's cheeks were pale, and her manner greatly agitated. Though evidently intending to come in, it seemed an effort to enter the room, and is still greater to speak when there. Catherine, supposing some uneasiness on Captain Tilney's account, could only express her concern by silent attention, obliged her to be seated, rubbed her temples with lavender water, and hung over her with affectionate solicitude. My dear Catherine, you must not. You must not indeed, were Eleanor's first connected words. I am quite well. This kindness distracts me. I cannot bear it. I come to you on such an errand. An errand to me? How shall I tell you? Oh, how shall I tell you? A new idea darted into Catherine's mind, and turning as pale as her friend, she exclaimed, "'Tis a messenger from Woodston." She's afraid of some messenger bringing bad news about Henry. "'You are mistaken indeed,' returned Eleanor, looking at her almost compassionately. "'It is no one from Woodston. It is my father himself.' Her voice faltered, and her eyes were turned to the ground as she mentioned his name. His unlooked-for return was enough in itself to make Catherine's heart sink, and for a few moments she hardly supposed there anything worse to be told. She said nothing, and Eleanor, endeavoring to collect herself and speak with firmness, but with eyes still cast down, soon went on. You are too good, I am sure, to think the worse of me for the part I am obliged to perform. I am indeed a most unwilling messenger. After what has so lately passed, so lately been settled between us, how joyfully, how thankfully on my side, as to your continuing here as I hoped for many, many weeks longer, how can I tell you that your kindness is not to be accepted? and that the happiness your company has hitherto given us is to be repaid by. But I must not trust myself with words. My dear Catherine, we are to part. And then Eleanor, no doubt directed by the general, gives Catherine a trumped-up story about why she has to leave so early. But rather than giving her a few days to get ready to leave, it turns out that Catherine will be thrown out of the house the very next morning, which is clearly a sudden and impolite dismissal and seen as an insult by Catherine. Monday, so soon as Monday, and you all go. Well, I am certain of, I shall be able to take leave, however. I need not go till just before you do, you know. Do not be distressed, Eleanor. I can go on Monday very well. Monday is very soon for the arrangement to make a trip all the way back to Fullerton. And because she's a young woman traveling alone, she's going to need some accompaniment or some way of going, and they're going to need to know to expect her. So that if she doesn't arrive, they know that they need to look for her. And not having cell phones or telegrams or anything like that, it's going to take longer than Monday to get them a message. My father and mother's having no notice of it is of very little consequence. The general will send a servant with me, I dare say, half the way, and then I shall soon be at Salisbury, and then I am only nine miles from home. Ah, Catherine, were it settled so, it would be somewhat less intolerable. 
though in such common attentions you would have received but half what you ought. But, how can I tell you, tomorrow morning is fixed for your leaving us, and not even the hour is left to your choice. The very carriage is ordered, and will be here at seven o'clock, and no servant will be offered you. Catherine sat down, breathless and speechless. I could hardly believe my senses when I heard it, and no displeasure, no resentment that you feel in this moment, however justly great, can be more than I myself. But I must not talk of what I felt. Oh, that I could suggest anything in extenuation. Good God, what will your father and mother say? After courting you from the protection of real friends to this, almost double distance from your home, to have you driven out of the house without considerations of even decent civility. Dear, dear Catherine, in being the bearer of such a message, I see myself guilty of all its insult. Yet I trust you will acquit me, for you must have been long enough in this house to see that I am but a nominal mistress of it, that my real power is nothing. Have I offended the general, said Catherine in a faltering voice? So Catherine is aware of what a shocking treatment this is of her to be thrown out of the house the next morning with no notice, no servant, no notice to her home, no accompaniment on the trip is truly a disgraceful treatment, a way that you would treat someone who you are banishing because they've done something horrendous. And Catherine is properly shocked. I hope, I earnestly hope, that to your real safety it will be of none, but to everything else it is of the greatest consequence to comfort appearance propriety to your family, to the world. And then Catherine, of course, recognizes not only the impropriety, but the shame in such a dismissal. Catherine's swelling heart needed relief, and Eleanor's presence, friendship, and pride had eagerly restrained her tears. But no sooner was she gone than they burst forth in torrents. Turn from the house, and in such a way, without any reason that could justify any apology that could atone for the abruptness, the rudeness, nay, the insolence of it. Henry at a distance, not able even to bid him farewell. Every hope, every expectation from him suspended at least, and who could say how long? Who could say when they might meet again? And all this by such a man as General Tilney, so polite, so well-bred, and heretofore so particularly fond of her. It was as incomprehensible as it was mortifying and grievous. From what it could arise and where it could end were considerations of equal perplexity and alarm. The manner in which it was done was so grossly uncivil, hurrying away without any reference to her own convenience, or allowing her even the appearance of choice as the time or mode of her traveling. Of two days the earliest fixed on, and of that almost the earliest hour as resolved to get her gone before he was stirring in the morning, that he might not be obliged even to see her. What could all this mean but an intentional affront? Heavily passed the night. Sleep or repose that deserved the name of sleep was out of the question. That room in which her disturbed imagination had tormented on her first arrival was again the scene of agitated spirits and unquiet slumbers. Yet how different now the source of her inquietude from what it had then been. How mournfully superior in reality and substance. Her anxiety had foundation in fact, her fears in probability, and with a mind so occupied in the contemplation of actual and natural evil, the solitude of her situation, the darkness of her chamber, the antiquity of the building, were felt and considered without the smallest emotion, and though the wind was high and often produced strange and sudden noises throughout the house, she heard it all as she lay awake, hour after hour, without curiosity or terror. And so Catherine has been totally awakened to the reality of her situation. And while she was once fearing Gothic horrors that didn't exist, she was completely blind to the actual social horror that she ultimately confronts. Of course, Catherine returns back to Fullerton and her perfectly sensible parents, who make not such a big deal out of her adventure as it seemed to her. And then later... Henry shows up, explains the problem, explains that General Tilney had thrown her out because he believed her to be pretending to be something that she wasn't. And Henry gallantly shows up and proclaims his devotion to her and his willingness to throw off his father in favor of her. And ultimately all ends well in the novel. And Catherine finally recognizes that rather than facing imagined Gothic dangers, she faces real social dangers in the society in which she is embedded. Further, she recognizes that the general, far from being the gothic villain she had imagined him to be, is simply an everyday common social climbing kind of villain. But nevertheless, he turns out to be the real antagonist and villain of the novel. Catherine, at any rate, heard enough to feel that in suspecting General Tilney of either murdering or shutting up his wife, she had scarcely sinned against his character or magnified his cruelty. So this is a comedic novel, and it has its happy ending with the marriage of the young couple. But it also has its more serious side as well, which is the necessity of a young woman 
learning to navigate the social circumstance in which the kinds of villains one faces are social climbers seeking to improve their social position through marrying wealth or position. This is the kind of social situation available in the early industrial period, during which it was possible to move into the upper classes, and gaining wealth and position now became available to a large group of people who had never had access to it before, and the young people who are engaged now in forming relationships in this new circumstance need to learn how to navigate this new social structure. This is a good transition point to turn to the Victorian novel, which we'll be looking at in the coming weeks, which shifts to address and reflect middle-class values, and to some extent make fun of those values as well. 